Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Walls Lecture this afternoon. Uh, many of you may know that the lecture today, named for Florence Mahoney, recognizes a woman who was a great champion of NIH and NIH research in back in the earlier days of NIH, and in fact, very much responsible for the successful establishment of NIA. Um, Florence was very interested in research on aging, especially basic research, and back uh, every year I would meet with her until she, until she died at the age of 103. Uh, she would be sitting with papers and journals and want to hear who we were proposing as the next speaker to make sure that she thought it was good hard science, something she would approve of, and I think she'd very much approve of, of today's speaker. So this is in her honor. Uh, it's particularly gratifying to be able to introduce the speaker today. Uh, Andy Singleton is uh, one of us, meaning one of NIA and one of the intramural programs here. He is the chief of the lab of neurogenetics. Uh, and in addition to the work that he's doing, I just want to make sure not to forget to pay tribute to the attitude that he, his lab, and the intramural program, I think, has uh, epitomized in terms of collaboration, particularly around the neurosciences, crossing institute barriers, and a real commitment to the sense of data sharing at the very best and highest level. Andy's own work and the work of his group has been notable for identifying some of the prominent genetic causes and risk factors for Parkinson's disease, uh, synuclein gene dosage, uh, the LARC gene, which have together in both genetic predisposed populations and in the general population become targets for interventions. He's been recognized by a number of, of awards, uh, the J. Van Anden Award, the first recipient of that for research in Parkinson's disease, uh, and quite recently, uh, notably recognized as an NIH Distinguished Scholar, one of the highest honors we have to award internally. He's on advisory boards, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, as well as to the frontotemporal dementia groups, uh, recognizing again uh, his contributions across the fields of neurodegeneration. Uh, so we'll have a chance to listen to him, and then there'll be a period for questions thereafter, followed by a reception. But today, uh, he's covered it all in his title, I think, Age, Gene, Sex, and Smell. Predicting Parkinson's disease, I think there isn't much else to talk about. Annie. So thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to give the uh, Florence Mahoney Lecture. Thank you, Richard, so much for inviting me to, to speak today about um, the work that's going on in the lab. Um, I was told to have a, a salacious title. Richard told me to have a salacious title, hence this title. But uh, it's a bit of a bait and switch because this is only part of um, what I'll be talking about today. Really, the main theme is something that, that Rich has already touched on, which is, um, I think, a philosophy that we've tried to carry out in our lab, which is one about integrating data, sharing data, sharing people, and sharing ideas. And I'm going to give some, some uh, uh, stories that reflect that philosophy and progress that we've made over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So I've been at NIH now for uh, 2000, so 15 years. I came here early in uh, 2001. I thought I would come here for three or four uh, years. I saw myself as a traveling scientist going from exotic locale to exotic locale, so I thought I'd only be here for a, a short period of time. But um, I've absolutely loved my time here at the intramural program, and I think I've loved it for, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, the support. Um, the support from our leadership. I've had great scientific uh, uh, directors, first Dan Longo and then uh, Luigi Ferrucci, people who really saw the value in the type of science that we're doing and just in promoting um, uh, good science. I've had great support even from other institutes. Uh, Story Landis as the SD of NINDS was very supportive of our work as has um, Alan Koretsky over the last, over the last um, few years. It's just been, it's been wonderful. As well as that um, enjoyment from, work, from uh, uh, the leadership at the top, there's also the fact that you get to work with tons of really smart people. When I first came to NIH, I was uh, uh, a naive, I guess, 28, 29-year-old, and um, uh, a scientist who I really liked and respected advised me that there was no better place to go than the NIH intramural program. He described it as Disneyland for doctors, and I really think it's true. Right, you get to come here and um, 
talk with really smart people who are, who are just genuinely interested in asking scientific questions, interesting scientific questions, and who are um, ready to work with you. Now, the idea of not having pressure, the pressure of applying for grants means that people can be pretty free with their time and free with their collaboration, and, and that's been just absolutely enormous fun. Another part that's been enormous fun is working with these people. So um, this is, these are the uh, investigators and group leaders in my lab. Our lab is, uh, uh, the lab in total is around 55 people, something like that. And our lab is called the Laboratory of, of Neurogenetics. The idea of our lab is to use genetics to understand um, disease. So right from the very basic part, which is finding genetic um, causes and contributors towards disease, through to understanding what those do in the context of disease biology, of pathobiology, all with the aim, really, of finding um, a point of therapeutic intervention. Almost all of the diseases that we work on, the only therapeutics are really symptomatic. They don't do anything to, to stop the disease um, progressing. So we're really centered on this notion of, of trying to, to understand the disease at the etiologic level so we can come up with, it, with a place to try and uh, hit with the therapy. So with that in mind, we have groups that are scattered across various domains. So we have um, really three genetics groups, a molecular genetics group, which I, I run, um, which works on Parkinson's disease, ataxia, um, dystonia, a little bit of Alzheimer's disease. We have um, a neuromuscular disease research group, which works on the genetics of um, neuromuscular diseases. Um, mainly ALS has been extremely successful, run by Brian Trainer. A new genetics group, which is actually an NINDS group hosted in an NIA lab, again, showing this idea of, um, of collaboration um, between institutes run by Sonia Schultz, working on a, a disease called dementia with Lewy bodies. And then we have a couple of groups that aim to try and translate that progress. Uh, uh, the first run by Mark Cookson, um, which works on cell biology and gene expression, and the second by Huibin Kai, um, which uses really animal modeling. And the idea um, is for genes to move through this pathway, for things that are identified to move through this pathway, supported by um, three other group leaders who are uh, really incredibly talented at helping us move data and ideas um, both from outside the uh, lab and within the lab. And that's, that's Raf Gibbs, who runs the computational biology group, uh, Dina Hernandez, who runs the, the genomic technologies group, and an, an amazing statistical geneticist called Mike Knowles, who runs the stats group. We really function as a group much more like this. Um, uh, so the, the, the point I want to make by showing this is that the work that I present today is the result of a conscious decision of this entire group, of this entire management group. We each know what the others are doing, and we each think in a long-term way about where we'd like to place our collective resources in terms of understanding disease, both at the genetic level and at the functional level. So everything that I talk about today comes from this group, not, not, not just from me, but from the collective decisions of this group. And we try very hard to, um, to uh, be able to move ideas and people around between these groups. So we have postdocs and students that will flip between groups, projects that will move, move between groups. The, the lab is set up in this way. And I think it's, a, it's something that's worked really, really well for us. We also collaborate really extensively. So this, these are uh, published collaborations from a two and a half year um, uh, period um, resulting from publications. So we get to collaborate with groups all over the world, it's something that's um, uh, born in part out of necessity um, for genetics, but also um, uh, has been extremely useful for um, the downstream functional work. So this is not just genetics collaborations, it's collaborations with the transgenics group and the cell bio group, um, uh, really bringing data together from disparate sources. So I think that this is the broad schema of what we try to do in the lab. Um, it's a very sim sim simple figure, very simplified figure, obviously. Find a locus, find the gene that causes uh, disease at that locus or that predisposes to disease at that locus. Um, use that genetic information to understand the etiology of disease, and with that understanding of the etiology, try and find a point of viable therapeutic intervention. One of the points um, that I'll try and hit today is that we've had a tremendous amount of success on the left-hand side of this schema, on the finding genes part. 
And that's not because the geneticists are smarter, obviously. It's because we have the tools with which to look in a very broad and unbiased manner to try and find uh, genetic influences in disease. I think that the success that we've had, and we have had success in, in the functional domain in understanding etiology has been much harder won. But I think there's hope there. I think there's um, hope in uh, the application of genomic style technologies to uh, functional understanding of disease. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that and about how data integration across these different uh, stages can really inform discovery. So these are the four stories that I'll talk about today. Um, I mentioned earlier that we work on a whole bunch of different diseases. I would say that uh, probably 50 or 60 percent of the lab's effort centers on Parkinson's disease or, or very closely uh, related diseases. But we also have pretty substantial efforts in ALS, frontotemporal dementia, um, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, Alzheimer's disease, ataxia, anything neurological and mainly things that are neurodegenerative. But today the stories that I'm going to tell are really um, centered on Parkinson's, on Parkinson's disease. They only represent really a fraction of what we do, but, but I think they're, they're illustrative in, in the context of the, the point that I'm trying to get across about integration. So the first one, um, this will be a story that's, uh, that's familiar in design to anyone who's been involved in complex genetics over the last five or six years. And this is about integrating genome-wide association data with other forms of high content, um, unbiased data. So here we have um, a picture of the genomic architecture of Parkinson's disease probably around two years or so ago. Um, like most, um, like most uh, commonish diseases, we'd had as a field quite a lot of success in finding uh, genetic mutations that underlie monogenic forms of disease. Generally pretty rare monogenic forms of disease. Um, but nonetheless, this was where um, we'd had most success. And this is the, the group of things in the top left-hand corner. Notably, the very first mutation identified in Parkinson's disease was identified here in 1997 by uh, Bob Nussbaum's um, uh, group. And I was lucky enough to uh, cross over with Bob whilst he was at NIH. And he was uh, uh, an incredibly useful person to talk to, a very thoughtful um, person when it came to uh, applying genetics in, in uh, neurological disease. That's been followed by a whole bunch of other discoveries um, causing either Parkinson's disease or, or things that look like Parkinson's, either neuropathologically or more often actually clinically rather than neuropathologically. Since about 2006, there's also been a, a fair amount of success in this bottom right-hand corner of the graph. So um, this represents identification of um, common genetic variability that imparts risk for disease. So not variants that are going to cause disease, but things that increase your risk by 10%, 20%, 30%. And of course, this is the result of genome-wide association. So if you look at this graph as of two years ago, a year and a half ago, you think, well, we've got 30 or so loci or genes. How much more is there to, to find? And there's a way to identify this. So the um, the traditional approach would have been to take a, a twin study and um, look at uh, a concordance between uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins and look for an excess of concordance in the monozygotic twins. It's pretty straightforward, but it's hard to do because, of course, you have to collect twins with uh, these kinds of diseases. So um, uh, the estimates tended to be rather inaccurate and to have fairly big error bars. So around three or four years ago, this uh, new technique was um, described, which essentially uses um, uh, the fact that we have very large cohorts of patients and people without disease who've been genotyped very densely using genome-wide SNP chips. So using this data, you're able to estimate at a very fine uh, genetic level how much more related any group of individuals is than any other group of individuals. So by looking at the genetic sharing, the genetic similarity in PD cases, uh, and comparing that to the genetic similarity that's seen amongst controls, you can get an estimate of the uh, heritable component of disease. What part of the disease is due to common genetic heritability? A couple of caveats to this approach. Um, the, the primary one being is that, that it doesn't capture all forms of heritable components. So it doesn't capture um, rare genetic variability. It really only focuses on common genetic variability. 
and it doesn't capture de novo things, things that are occurring um, for the first time. However, with that said, and based on those caveats, recognizing that this is probably an underestimate of the heritability, this is what we think the heritable, heritable nature of PD is. It's about 30%. So what that means is that um, it doesn't mean that 30% of Parkinson's disease cases are genetic in origin. It means that every Parkinson's disease case, on average, about 30% of the burden of that disease is driven by genes. The rest, presumably, is driven by uh, exterior influences, environment, or even um, stochastic a stochastic chance, which we can get to later if, if need be. So if this is based on the whole genome, and we have 30 or so loci that we've identified, we can, of course, just look at those loci and see how much of this 30% have we captured. So that's what this graph shows. We have 30 genes. You know, that's an incredible amount compared to where we were 10 or 15 years ago. But we're, we really are only capturing about 10 to 15% of the total heritable uh, nature of the disease. So there's tons more to find. There's tons more of genetic influence to find in this disease. So how to find it? This really is uh, illustrative of one of the great things about being in the intramural program. I think one of the things that, that we've recognized and we've tried to use is that by having um, stability here, stable funding, stability of personnel, stability of ideas, we're able to um, we're able to uh, start ideas moving and create a hub for uh, collabor collaborative endeavors. So we were able to create the infrastructure to analyze data from around the world and to invite everybody who has genome-wide association data for Parkinson's disease to push their data to NIH. We'll analyze it and we'll share it with everybody. It's a, a tremendous advantage. We don't have to go through that, the, the, the hoops of applying for grants. We can just say this is a good idea Let's, let's support it. So this enabled us to bring in investigators outside of our consortium um, from various academic centers. And in addition, actually, uh, a, a group from a for-profit um, center. So you'll notice that a large amount of genotyping here comes from 23andMe, which is uh, a direct-to-consumer um, genetic testing service. And you might wonder why they have so many cases that are, are uh, Parkinson's disease cases. Um, so this is based around the story that uh, 23andMe's founder is called Anne Wazicki, uh, and uh, she is married to a, she was married to a guy called Sergey Brin, who is the founder of Google, one of the, the, the founders of Google, and um, his mother has Parkinson's disease, and he carries uh, a mutation which gives him a very high likelihood of Parkinson's disease. He carries actually a mutation that we found in 2004 in uh, in LERP2. So he's very motivated uh, to do something about Parkinson's disease. And when you're motivated and your wife owns a genetic testing company and you have $20 billion, you can afford to genotype some individuals. So they genotyped individuals. So we were able to, to access this data and bring it in. So this is what you get from these kinds of data. You get a Manhattan plot, things that are genome-wide significant in, in yellow. Um, obviously, the next stage then is replication. Um, we uh, replicated this data using a set of um, around 14,000 samples, 7,000 cases, 7,000 controls, um, using a custom array that, that we designed and, and released, actually. Um, it's kind of a cool array uh, in that it not only looks for a common genetic variability, but it also has every uh, neurological disease uh, mutation that was known and assayable at the time. So it's, a, it's kind of a cool thing to be able to run. When you do an initial GWAS like this with uh, um, sample sizes of this size, you know, 13,000 cases, uh, 80,000 controls, pretty much everything replicates. Uh, pretty much everything, after good QC, pretty much everything replicates. And this is the case here. Uh, we went from 15 or so loci up to, to 28 of our 30 putative loci, including some really interesting new things that were popping up. So. Uh, GTP cyclohydrolase is the rate-limiting enzyme in dopamine synthesis. This hadn't shown up before, and it shows up, shows up here. Some, so some interesting biological insight. So we, as a, as a lab, when you think about the construction of the lab of uh, genetics moving forward to function, our typical approach uh, stemmed from 
um, looking at monogenic disease. So uh, you find a mutation that pretty much causes disease, you then throw it into a cell system or an animal system and you look for really large changes. Um, you can't do this with genome-wide association. And this is something that we thought about very early on. We were a very early adopter of GWAS. We, I think we ran our first genome-wide association starting in 2005. And we were thinking as a group about how uh, these genetic variants were going to move through our pipeline. Um, there are a couple of problems with, with, with taking these through a traditional cell bio pipeline or animal pipeline. The first is that they're risk variants. So unlike mutations, they don't cause disease, they just increase your risk by 10 or 20 percent. So it's hard to know what you'd look for. You'd be looking for a pretty subtle effect. The second part is that the vast majority of these loci, there is no uh, protein coding change that is um, causing that association. So for the majority of GWAS loci, they have to be driven by a change in expression of some shape or form. And, and that can be pretty broad, right? That can be just plain old expression. It can be splicing. It can be induced expression. It can be where the RNA goes in the cell, which cell type it's expressed in, all those kinds of things. So with that in mind, with those two problems in mind, um, we came together again as a lab. And this, this project involves almost every group that, that I showed initially um, to create this resource. And this resource centered on around four or 500 um, brains, human brains from neurologically normal people at time of death um, for whom there was frozen tissue available from these two uh, tissue types. And we performed genome-wide genotyping on these, on these um, uh, subjects uh, using the same arrays we'd use for association. We looked at, at RNA using expression arrays, using RNA chips. We resequenced um, regions that we're particularly interested in for Parkinson's disease. We looked at DNA methylation. And the whole idea of this, of this work was to be able to create really a, just a big lookup table so that when you find a risk allele um, in your association study, you can then look at that allele in the context of what it does in the human brain for expression or for DNA methylation. It allows you to look things up very quickly. I should say that for about 30% of our uh, genome-wide association loci, we find an effect. We find a statistically significant effect, uh, such as an EQTL or a methylation QTL. And I'm going to give one example here. So this is the synuclein gene. I mentioned that um, the very first gene identified to be linked to Parkinson's disease was alpha synuclein. Bob Nussbaum in 1997 found point mutations. Um, the, the really striking thing about the synuclein gene is not only that um, mutations cause disease, but that the protein product is a major component of the pathonomic hallmark of Parkinson's disease. So to have a post-mortem diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, you have to have intracellular Lewy bodies, and those Lewy bodies are made up of synuclein. So here we have a gene that's mutated, causes disease, and that gene encodes the protein that is the, the key um, deposit in these diseases. As well as being the first gene identified to contain mutations that cause disease, this was really the first gene that popped up in genome-wide association as containing common genetic variability that imparts risk for, for disease. And as we drilled further and further down into that data, we realized that actually there's more than one signal there. So there's a primary signal um, at the three prime end of the gene in intron, in intron four, which is the one you see when you run your initial genome-wide association study. But when you uh, adjust out that signal, you see a second independent signal in the promoter region. So two individual signals, two individual risk alleles in synuclein, um, both uh, conferring risk for Parkinson's disease. So when you look at these uh, two signals, first overlaying uh, DNA methylation data from these, from these brains, um, we can look at around 40 or 50 CPG sites scattered across the synuclein gene. Um, both of these risk alleles had a very, very significant effect on DNA methylation at a single um, CPG site. I think this was ranked one and two in, in, uh, for, for each, of these, each of these SNPs. So you have two independent risk alleles um, for disease that both affect a single CPG site in the same direction. The more risk allele burden you carry, the higher DNA methylation is at that particular site. This is a site 
that's in the promoter region of Sinuclin. It's on a, a southern shore of a CPG island, so, so likely important in, uh, in um, transcriptional regulation or at least transcriptional potential of, of Sinuclin. So obviously the next thing to do there is to dig into the expression data and say, does, does expression, uh, is expression also altered by this genetic variability? And it was, we could only detect this for the primary GWAS signal. I think that's in large part because the effect size is pretty small. But we see um, an increase in synuclein associated with uh, the synuclein uh, risk alleles. And this makes perfect sense from a biological standpoint. So in 2003, our lab found um, synuclein triplication. So carrying two additional copies of synuclein um, was a cause of, of uh, Parkinson's disease. These patients double the amount of synuclein mRNA and protein that they produce in the brain and also actually in, in blood. And they tend to get disease in their 30s and 40s. Not long after that, um, other groups described duplication mutations, so carrying just one additional copy of synuclein, a 50% increase in synuclein production. And these patients get disease in their 40s, tend to die in their 50s. The disease course is a bit more benign. So this makes perfect sense. We have a, a nice dose relationship here. The more synuclein you produce, the younger onset your disease. So it makes perfect sense that for the typical later onset disease that shifting synuclein production by 10-15% um, increases risk for, for disease. So I think this, this first level of integration early on showed us the power of bringing in, um, bringing together large unbiased data sets, unbiased genetics data sets, unbiased expression and DNA methylation data sets. I think it's told us, it's also taught us of the power of uh, bringing together uh, groups from around the world with these, uh, with these large data sets. We know that a substantial amount of PD risk remains unknown. Um, there are a whole bunch of, of new loci that we've identified through this uh, meta-analysis that I've showed. I should say we have another four or five new uh, PD loci um, that I hope will be published soon, again, um, through expanding this kind of study. And for some of these risk loci, we can find um, a, a immediate biological effects in terms of DNA methylation or expression. And these make sense in the context of synuclein. They make sense. So this second part is, is a, a, a more recent um, experience from integrating uh, data. And this, again, centers on um, using genome-wide association data, but also an, using another relatively unbiased genetic data, which is exome, uh, exome sequencing. So this is a representation of um, the state of play of our understanding of monogenic forms of Parkinson's disease. I think there are 10 genes here or so that uh, contain mutations that cause Parkinson's disease or, or something like um, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. The first of these was found in 97. And I should say that for the vast majority, we don't really know what these do. So I think one of the questions that we have to face um, pretty often in, in, in genetics, in the genetics world, and it's a question that I think we ask ourselves is, if we have these 10 genes, and we don't really know what their proteins do in the context of disease, should we be looking for additional stuff? Should we be looking for additional genes, or should we be focusing our time and effort in understanding what these do? And I think that this, this um, misunderstands the power of genetics. So the idea about genetics is to get concrete information, information um, regarding whether a gene is definitely or not involved in disease and use that to create a window into the, into the etiology. Use that as a foundation of knowledge and the broader the foundation, the greater chance we have of, of starting to bring these things together into a coalescent network or, or, or actually networks. So with that in mind, um, some of this work has been done already, functional work, um, uh, bringing some of these protein products together. Uh, Parkin, Pink1, FBX07 have been brought together uh, in uh, mitophagy, some, there's some really beautiful work by Richard Yule at NINDS that, um, that um, uh, uh, tackles this, tackles this uh, issue. But with this in mind, we wanted to find um, more genetic influences in disease to try and find more links like this between, um, between these proteins, try and find some kind of uh, coalescent network. So in order to do this, 
um, we embarked upon exome sequencing, so sequencing the protein coding regions of the genome in roughly 1,300 um, Parkinson's cases, mostly younger onset Parkinson's cases, because we believe they have a, a greater genetic component and are more likely to have a simple genetic influence than a complex um, uh, genetic influence. And as a, as a very, uh, as a very um, easy first pass, um, we look in this group for possession of homozygous or, or compound heterozygous extremely damaging mutations with the idea that, that some of this disease is going to be caused by recessive mutations. So if we just scan for um, stop mutations or frame shifts or splice site mutations and look for an excess of those mutations in a, in a gene compared to uh, what you see in controls, this would be a good candidate for, for disease. So this was one of the candidates. I would say we had, um, after doing this, this um, kind of low-hanging fruit troll through the data, one of the candidates was this gene, VPS13C. And you can see we've got a couple of individuals, no segregation, but a couple of individuals who have homozygous or compound heterozygous, very damaging mutations. But this is a large gene. There are, these mutations could have occurred by chance. There were certainly other candidates in our, our top 10, top 20, that looked as compelling as this. However, because we are involved in the genetics of lots of different aspects of disease, we're able to overlay other data. And we're able to, to, to note that one of the newly identified genome-wide association loci for Parkinson's disease was also VPS13C. So here we have some uh, somewhat compelling evidence, um, perhaps not enough to take us to the, to the top of the, the heap um, based on mutation screening alone. And that really gets pushed up by the notion that there's also common genetic variability at this particular locus that, that confers risk for disease. So we're able to find additional mutations in this gene, in this uh, VPS13C uh, gene. And I think really the nail in the coffin proving that the, the mutations in this are causal of disease is that each of the patients with these mutations has a, has a very, an extraordinarily distinctive phenotype. Probably out of the 1,300 or so patients that we screened, only 10 or 20 have a phenotype similar to this. Um, young onset, very rapid uh, decline, which is unusual. Uh, um, some motor neuron deficits and early dementia. So I think this really ties, um, really ties this together as a, as a nice story. This was just published a month or two ago. Um, and what is, uh, there, are, there are two really quite fascinating aspects of this beyond the genetics. The first is that VPS13C, the protein, interacts with PINK1 and PARK in, in this mitophagy um, pathway. So immediately we're creating another link to an established network. Um, the second one bears some background. So I mentioned that, that many of the mutations that have been identified in, in, in Parkinson's disease cause Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. And there's been a lot of argument about whether, particularly for some of the younger onset forms, whether they're truly relevant to Parkinson's disease in large part because the disease is very atypical, but also because pathologically they don't really look like Parkinson's disease. They don't have, they generally don't have Lewy bodies. They don't have um, quite the same amount of cell loss. So there's been a lot of argument about whether really understanding PINK1 and Parkin has anything to do with typical Parkinson's disease. So what was really compelling about the VPS13C um, experiment is that it created a functional link with PINK1 and PARKIN, but that the patients with this mutation, we have one patient who went to autopsy, has fulminant alpha synuclein pathology. So it really starts to tie this pathway into aggregation of alpha synuclein and mishandling of synuclein, and tells you that, that the likely looking at PARKIN and PINK1 is extremely relevant to, um, to typical Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. So in this instance, a simple lookup, a simple having this large-scale data available allowed us to um, really push a candidate to the top of our pile. Um, whilst the mutations are extremely rare, I think they're incredibly uh, informative. Um, we're now leading a much deeper dive into this data, um, again, using a meta-analysis, bringing together exome data from all over the world um, in Parkinson's disease. We now have around 5,000 exomes or genomes um, that are being analyzed in the cloud um, for uh, both risk and, and mutations. So this next section 
um, I think is really, um, is really a beautiful piece of work. So this is work that was led by uh, Mark Cookson. Um, Mark Cookson runs the Cell Bio Group in, in uh, our lab. And I, I show this data. This data is um, a couple of years old. But I show this data because I think it's really illustrative in where we should be going and, and the way in which we should be tackling um, uh, complex genetics. So Mark had taken uh, an approach here um, um, that was founded on a gene that we know is involved in disease, a gene called LERC2, um, uh, which contains mutations that, that um, are actually quite common in certain, certain populations. It's a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty large gene. It's a kinase. And what, uh, of course, there's been a lot of effort over the last, uh, we found it in 2004, so over the last 12 years to try and understand what it does, what it interacts with, um, uh, potentially what it, what it phosphorylates. Mark decided to take on um, a fairly large scale and um, quite labor intensive experiment, which aimed to take the full length um, LERC2 and use it as a probe against proto-arrays. So these are arrays of proteins, 10,000 or so proteins, uh, you take uh, LERC2 and you throw it against these arrays and you look to see what LERC2 um, binds. Obviously, this is uh, independent of context, right? It, uh, the, you don't know that the proteins are going to be expressed in the same cells or in the same cell space, but, but it gives you a first pass look at what LERC2 will bind to efficiently. And the result you get from this is this kind of plot here, um, where you have GFP was the control. So, any of those dots in the top left-hand corner are individual proteins that look to bound to um, and, and uh, showed a strong, strong signal for. So as a traditional kind of step in uh, reductionist cell biology, you'd be stuck there with 30 or 40 potential proteins, and you'd have to figure out a way to prioritize them, um, either based on their binding affinity, their p-value, or what you thought about them functionally. You know, did you think they were fairly interesting? But of course, we have lots of data in the lab. We have tons of data, um, genetic data. So Mark was able to overlay um, the genetic data that we have um, for association. And this actually, um, Mark tells this story much, much better than I do, but this really arose out of conversation, out of um, uh, integration of people in the lab uh, and just chance com conversation between someone working on this project and someone working on the genetics project and saying, well, why don't we overlap things and see what happens? And what we see is um, a real enrichment of proteins that interact with LERC2. Uh, um, these proteins are uh, encoded underneath genome-wide association peaks. So you see many more of those proteins than you would expect by, by chance. You can then, of course, add additional layers of data. So um, one of those proteins is a protein called RAB7L1. It's actually now called RAB29. Um, so we see uh, Mark saw an interaction between LERC2 and RAB29. Uh, so then we looked at our expression data. Um, are the risk alleles for PD uh, at RAB29 associated with changes in RAB29 expression? And indeed, indeed they are. Uh, and when you look at RNA-seq data, you see an imbalance. When you sequence a heterozygote, you see one allele is expressed at a lower level than the other in, in the RNA. So here you have a protein that interacts with LERC2, a known, uh, a known PD gene, and an effect, a, a biologic effect of the risk allele. So RAB7L1 wasn't the only protein that Mark looked at. He, also, he and his group also looked at GAC. And um, of course, this screening is a first step. It doesn't replace really good, careful reductionist cell biology, which is then what his group went on to do, and, and show that RAB7L1 and GAC and LERC2 form a complex. And I think this is a really, uh, a really, beautiful, a really beautiful study that, puts, um, that brings together fairly disparate pieces of evidence to show a nice, uh, a nice neat story. So we begin to link LERC2, um, a known PD gene, with uh, RAB7L1 and with GAC. So linking together genome-wide association um, genes, or loci, with uh, familial forms of disease, suggesting again that they form part of uh, a central network, a, a central disease network. So I mentioned that that group of hits was enriched for um, genes underneath PD loci. So you can dig into that, deep, that data a bit more deeply. Um, 
Here's a, a zoom in on one of our Manhattan plots, or one of our genome-wide association plots. This is a locus that was called INPP5. When we look at Mark's data, actually bag three interacts with loc 2 So I think that here, the gene that's, that's uh, the functional effector is, is, uh, is bag three. Same here, STK39. Again, the interactor here is ZERP2. Secondly, this locus SCAR-B2, the interactor is CXCL3. So what actually this data starts to give us, and, and again, I think this needs to be borne out by, uh, by careful cell biology, but what it's, I believe, starting to tell us is that you can link, um, uh, you can link uh, uh, genes involved in monogenic forms and involved in sporadic forms into a cohesive network by overlaying different types of unbiased um, high density data. And I think this has worked, this has worked really well. So again, OM-based unbiased methods um, have really helped link 3D proteins together. Um, I think that it has now nominated genes within the PD loci. Obviously, genome-wide association gives you loci, not genes. But I think this data is actually telling us what the gene is. Uh, and it's linked sporadic and familial disease together in the context of their etiology. So the last piece of um, data I wanted to talk about uh, uh, really centers around a different part of this um, schema. So um, when we think about this right-hand side of this schema, um, you can think of lots of reasons why um, going to a treatment can fail. You can have the, the wrong target, and I think that, that part of um, uh, what I've talked about today has really been centered on trying to find the right target, right? Trying to identify a, a disease network or networks so that you can find a good node in that network to intervene. But there are other reasons that um, trials can fail. It can be in the wrong patients. Um, it can be in patients who don't have the type of etiology that you're trying to treat. Or it can be applied at the wrong time. So um, one of the issues with the type of diseases that we work on, the neurodegenerative diseases, is that by the time a patient comes to clinic, They've had disease for at least a decade. A ton of the cells that you're really interested in in stopping from dying are already, are already dead. So um, it may be too late to intervene, uh, particularly at some of the early etiologic stages. So we have to figure out a way to um, be able to diagnose patients very early and very accurately, and also to be able to ascertain what type of disease, what molecular subtype of disease those, those patients have. So this is um, some work that we put a lot of effort into, um, particularly the uh, statistical genetics group in our lab over the last two years or so. And I think that we're starting to get some, some traction in this, in this realm. And it really revolves around these, these areas here, um, developing biomarkers. It shouldn't be bio, I don't think we're ever gonna have a biomarker. I think it's gonna be biomarkers. It's gonna be a constellation of things. Um, figuring out how people respond to treatment, um, being able to subtype individuals from a molecular perspective, and identifying at-risk individuals before they even know um, they, they are at risk or, or before they present with disease. So um, we have now, let's say, 45 genes or loci involved in uh, Parkinson's disease, either as risk factors or as mutations that um, Pretty much, cause, pretty much cause disease. We know the identity of the alleles, or at least we're able to tag those alleles. Uh, and we know that the amount of risk that they confer. So for any, any individual, we're able to genotype that individual and tell you how many risk alleles they carry and how much risk each of those alleles confers for disease. So you're able to create a genetic risk score for every individual in your, in your large um, cohort, cohort. It's based on this kind of weighted burden of, um, of risk alleles. And it's quite a nice way to conceptualize risk. So if you think about, um, if we take just GWAS hits by themselves uh, um, in isolation for now, each of those gives you an odds ratio of about 1.2, 1.3, something like that. However, if you take a, a, a group of um, individuals, people with disease and people without disease, and you um, figure out what each of those individuals' risk scores are, and then rank them from the people with the lowest amount of genetic risk to the people with the highest amount of, of genetic risk, um, 
you're about four or five times as likely to be a PD case if you're in the top 20% of genetic risk than if you're in the lower genetic, genetic uh, lower 20% of, of genetic risk. So it's a nice way of kind of uh, conceptualizing how cumulative these genetic um, risk factors are. So if we're able to do this, if we're able to ascribe a genetic risk to individuals, um, how can we apply this to understand things about disease? So our first work centered on, um, our training work centered on a cohort called the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. So this is a, a cohort of uh, newly diagnosed PD patients, um, literally uh, diagnosed within a, week, within a week or two of enrolling in the study. Um, uh, 400 patients, uh, 200 uh, controls, and 70 patients who were called SWEDs. And I'll, I'll, I'll just explain what those are because this becomes important later. So the SWEDs are individuals who are, um, uh, again, early diagnosed, diagnosed clinically with Parkinson's disease, but when you image them, they don't have dopaminergic deficit. And you would expect to see dopaminergic deficit in a PD brain. So clinically, they look like PD, but um, from a, a scanning perspective, they don't look like PD. This study is um, a longitudinal study. These patients have followed um, over a, a fairly long period of time. Um, uh, as you can imagine, this is expensive. This is, although run by um, the Fox Foundation, it's sponsored by industry. So this five-year study has cost about $70 million so far. And that's because they take every um, possible measure you can imagine on these patients, uh, be they clinic, clinical, uh, uh, imaging, uh, biologics. They're extremely well characterized. And um, another neat part about this is, um, much like our philosophy, everything that they produce goes into the public domain. So any scientific researcher can access this data. So this is a really well characterized group of patients. When we do, uh, when we take our genetic risk score and use it to predict um, from a cross-sectional study whether someone, whether a group of individuals are PD or not PD, um, we're about, we're accurate about 70% of the time. So we have an AUC of, of 70%, a predicted, pre, uh, predictive ability of about 70%. It's slightly better in the PPMI samples. Um, we get an AUC of about 0.75, much better than chance. You just, you know, if you were to just um, take your group of cases and controls and, and randomly assign them to, to one group or the other, your AUC would be 0.5. So this is significantly above um, what is random. And I think it's slightly better in PPMI because I think the diagnosis is just more thorough than uh, in our large cross-sectional studies. But we wanted to do better than this. 0.75 is not really good enough to um, alter clinical care. And we wanted to do better than this in a way that leveraged very, very accessible data, things that could be collected by mail that would cost less than $100 cumulatively that could, that could be done really easily. So we took every factor that was available from PPMI that um, you, could, you could access easily. So here we have age, smoking history, anosmia, handedness, caffeine intake, constipation, our genetic risk score, sex, um, self-reported sleep disturbance, family history. Um, for some of these, there's, they were collected because there's some evidence that they're involved in uh, uh, um, pre-morbid phases of, uh, of disease. Some of them not so much, like handedness, I don't know. Um, I guess that's just an easy thing to collect. So we take all of these data, um, Mike Knowles and his group took all of these data and essentially used a machine learning method to uh, basically keep any um, piece of information from these data that was useful in predicting whether someone was a case or a control and throw out anything that wasn't useful uh, and come up with a model, the best model at predicting, at predicting disease. And the results from this were quite striking. So we moved from uh, you know, a predictive ability of about 0.75 to one of 0.923. And this is, for an AUC, this is really um, pretty impressive. I don't know of many other um, diseases, certainly, uh, neurological diseases or neurodegenerative diseases where, uh, that aren't monogenic, where you can get a predictive value like this. And what turned out to be our five simple factors are um, sex, family history, um, genetic risk score, age, and sense of smell, whether the person was uh, losing their sense of smell. This is something that's assayed very easily with a, um, 
a sniff kit. You, you send someone a sniff kit through the mail. They scratch and sniff, and they tell you whether they can smell particular odors or not, and they get a score, basically. And PD patients have, have a known um, problem with sense of smell before disease. So this um, AUC, this model, the way this model works, has now been um, replicated in four other studies. Um, so it's, it's, it's extremely robust. The replication ranges with an AUC of 0.89 to uh, 0.94. So, so giving us exactly what we would, uh, giving us exactly what we would expect. So a really, I think, a really compelling um, story. When you look at this um, cumulative risk score, so this thing that, that carries together the sex and the, the age and family history, et cetera, um, and you plot out your distribution of cases and controls, um, this is what you get, pretty good separation. And we have um, a point of separation of about 0.65. So, so um, we say that anyone with a score above 0.65 is likely to be PD. Anyone below 0.65 is likely to be uh, controls. So the question is, what about the sweats? What about these patients that look clinically uh, at diagnosis like Parkinson's disease, but, but the scan looks a bit, a bit funny? Um, this, type of, um, this type of diagnostic problem is one that's really, um, I think, frustrating and on the minds of clinical trialists um, for neurodegenerative diseases. They are obsessed with running trials earlier, um, but also obsessed with the problems that that causes in terms of diagnostic accuracy. It's hard to be accurate in your diagnosis early on. So, so what do we see from this model in, in this large group of um, what could be thought of as, as PD mimic disorders? So this is what we see. We see um, actually a bimodal distribution. So based on our data, the SWEDs are um, by and large controls um, who just look like they have Parkinson's disease but with some cases, with this you know, peak on the other side with these cases. So that's all well and good. It's just an idea. It's just a hypothesis. But because PPMI is a longitudinal study and because the patients get DAT scanned over periods of time, um, we have follow-up DAT scans on these sweats. And some of them now have been characterized to have dopaminergic deficit. So when you overlay that on this group, you see that every single one of them that has now um, uh, dopaminergic deficit as, as um, attributed by uh, DAT scan is to the right of our prediction point, of our 0.65 prediction point. So we're accurately able to tell you which of those SWEDs are really going to be Parkinson's disease and actually conversely which of those SWEDs are not Parkinson's disease, which are controls and are unlikely to progress. So. I think this, um, this model has shown us uh, an ability to be able to categorize whether someone, um, early on, whether someone truly has PD or doesn't have PD um, using easy to access data. It allows an accurate car categorization of those two, of those two, um, of case versus control. It allows us to um, um, really start to tease apart um, stroke mimic disorder. It's been replicated, um, but of course, what we want to do is not, not tell you um, whether you have PD or don't have PD at diagnosis. We'd like to be able to tell you whether you're going to get Parkinson's disease or not before. So of the five measures that go into our model, four are um, time independent. So obviously age, sex, family history, and genetics don't really change. Um, but smell does. Smell is a time dependent factor. So if we, um, if we extrapolate backwards based on um, the track of a decline in um, ability to smell over time, we think that our model will allow us to be able to predict with an AUC of about 0.85 um, whether a person is a, a going to be a case or a control about three years before disease onset. Obviously, this has to get much better, but um, it's certainly a lot better than uh, the situation we were in even two or three years ago, and I think that this is a, a really um, a, a critical point of investigation that we have to keep moving on, um, particularly if we're really serious about applying etiologic-based uh, clinical trials. Obviously, this needs a, a prospective population-style cohort. I'm going to show one very, very last piece of data before, um, before wrapping up because I couldn't resist it. This is um, incredibly, uh, incredibly preliminary data. 
so you can choose to take this with a complete, um, a complete pinch of salt. But I think that conceptually, it's, it's really quite interesting. So if we take the, the PPMI study, and we also use the, the NINDS equivalent, the PDPP study in this, and we take every factor we can get our hands on at baseline in these individuals, um, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, a measurement in a biologic or a, a clinical measurement or a scan, anything we could get our, our hands on. And we essentially put this into a model and tell the model to try and break the patients down into groups, however, however many groups the model wants to break them down into. What's the most parsimonious solution? Really with the idea of trying to find um, subtypes of disease. It's a, it's a, a really uh, a hot thing in neurodegenerative disease to try and break these diseases down into, into subtypes. And what we got is, of course, you, you lose lots of things out of the model, things that aren't informative. But what we got consistently in this data, and this is the data from PPMI, and in the data from, P, from PDBP, is production of um, two subtypes of disease. So all of these data separate patients out into, into two subtypes. The majority of um, patients are in the triangle side, um, the minority in the circle side. If you could see this in 3D, you'd see they actually separate. They're, they're not really overlapping. They're, they're separating on another, another plane. So that's kind of interesting, I think, um, that you're able to uh, separate patients out based on baseline. But there are two, what I think, and, and again, this is very, very preliminary data, but I think this is quite um, uh, interesting, interesting data. There are two things that kind of stem out of this data, and that is that the rate of progression and the types of um, uh, additional symptoms that these patients suffer from differ between these groups. So based on um, baseline categorization, the prognosis of these patients of these patient groups is different. The other part, which is a, which is a, a, a more subtle um, observation, but one that I think will be incredibly important as we start to get towards precision or personalized medicine, is that the genetic differences between these groups, so genetics uh, contributes to the to splitting of these groups, the genetic difference is not based on how many genes you carry or how many risk alleles you carry, but which alleles you, risk, you carry. So some are common between the two groups, but there are differences. Um, uh, certain risk alleles identified by GWAS are only present in one group. Certain risk alleles identified by GWAS are only present in the other group. So this, to my mind, suggests that you have two distinct diseases. You have two distinct, potentially two distinct disease entities that progress at slightly different rates and have um, subtly different genetic etiologies. And one might assume that based on whatever your uh, etiologic-based therapy ten, uh, ends up being, that you might have to compartmentalize these patients before you run a clinical trial. You might have to treat um, group one with a therapy that's specific to group one and, uh, and um, group T two with a therapy that, that's specific for group two. And if you don't do this, your clinical trial will, will fail. So again, this is really preliminary, but I think it's, I think it's a, a nice illustrative um, example of where we're aiming to go. So where do I think we're going in the future? Um, so in the context of discovery, I, I said this at the beginning, I think that genetics is pretty straightforward. Actually, I think that, um, I think that we, we know what we need to do. Um, we just need uh, um, samples and money, really. I think uh, it's pretty straight, blood and money. Blood and money, that's gonna be the, lo the logo of our lab, I think. Um, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there are some nuances to it, and I think that, but, but I think in, in general we know where we need to go. Um, exome and genome and resequencing is all fairly standard now, and, and you can outsource much of this. There's tons more genetic influence to find, and even though some of that genetic influence may be small, it may be very informative in, in terms of biology. Um, a, a, a risk allele doesn't have to have a large effect to tell you a lot about the disease, um, about the disease biology. What we've been taught here is that more data is better. Integration, integration, integration. We have to produce these large data sets and integrate them. And I think that um, taking a genomics approach to biology is the way forward, to create unbiased data sets that allow us to, to understand um, what's going on from genetics in biology very quickly is a, great way, um, is a great way to move forward. I really hope that this type of functional screening um, 
uh, moves forward in the same way that um, genetics has over the next period of time, that we see uh, kind of an omics, uh, an omics approach to, to cell bio and uh, uh, really hitting these projects in a large way. The availability of deep data on patients is starting to allow sub, um, sub disease, sub dissection of disease and disease prognosis, and this is incredibly important. It's incredibly expensive, um, but it's incredibly important. But I think that there's an economy of scale there. Um, collect a population, collect everything you possibly can on that population, and uh, you'll have this kind of data for, for uh, cancer and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's and, and everything. So I think that's the way to go forward. So we'll continue to work really hard on this, um, on this schema. Um, I think that there's lots to, be do from the, lots to do from the genetics perspective. Uh, in terms of finding risk alleles, I think that's pretty straightforward. In terms of using genetics to predict disease, I think that's fun and exciting and challenging. And in terms of, of, of the biology, I think there's, there's a, a, a ton more to do. And hopefully this will push us towards this right-hand side. We really have to get there. We really have to get there. So with that, I'll show this um, summary photo of the lab. Um, there's, this is an old photo. There's lots of new people. There are uh, new people coming to our lab every week. Um, so it's difficult to catch up. Um, but um, I, I, I should say that um, while I felt really lucky to be here um, through the leadership and really lucky to be here um, because of the leaders of the individual groups in my lab, I'm really honored to have um, the students and the the technicians and the postdocs that work in our lab, they're really excited, they're driven, they're um, just a great bunch of people and it's, it really makes it fun to, to come into the lab every day. So with that I'll end and I'd be happy to take questions. up at, uh, at the microphones to questions. Let me uh, maybe uh, start with, with one, though, Andy. Y you've looked uh, and your lab has at a number of neurodegenerative diseases where uh, there might be an expectation you'd learn about commonalities as well as distinct distinguishing pathways. Do you want to comment on how fruitful that has been to date? Yeah, actually, that's been um, so. I actually had a section on that in this talk originally. And um, I realized that if I included that, I'd still be talking for another 20 or 30 minutes. So, so we have um, gained enormous benefit from looking at different neurodegenerative diseases, both in terms of looking for um, specific commonalities, so things that are shared in terms of genetics, but also more broadly in looking at ideas that are shared um, across diseases. So I don't know if Ellen Sidransky is here. So Ellen's lab was one of the, the, the groups that really pushed this idea that carrying a single Gaucher's mutation could be a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And this led us to thinking about whether there were other recessive diseases where um, there's a neurological component and carrying a single mutation might be a risk factor for a late onset disease. And this was really the impetus that led us to finding TREM2 mutations in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's a really elegant example of taking an understanding or an appreciation from one disease and transferring it to another. The other one is a, a disease that we're investing more and more time and effort into. It's an underserved disease called dementia with Lewy bodies, um, um, pretty common, um, that share some facets of Alzheimer's disease and some facets of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, so we've looked obviously at the genetics of each of those disorders and we see some commonalities and we see some specific differences. Um, so you, you'll remember that uh, uh, I showed the, the risk alleles at synuclein. There are two distinct lo loci at synuclein. Um, synuclein is also a risk factor for DLB, but only one of those alleles is a risk factor for DLB. So I think this starts to tell you that um, these might be driving differences in where synuclein is expressed in the brain. And my bet actually is that people that carry the, the quote unquote DLB risk allele in PD will go on to dement. So I think that, I think that this is a long way of saying looking across diseases has been incredibly useful. Great. So we'll, we'll start with a question. Let me just mention after about 10 minutes or so, we'll okay. ask folks to uh, adjourn to the library just down the hall where there'll be a little bit of a reception, a chance to ask more questions informally. But okay. Uh, you, 
I noticed that you had a lot of Scandinavian countries in your collaborators, and they're notorious for having great registries. And one of the things, the great type of epidemiologic studies they do are twin-twin, when they, they do like monozygotic slash yeah. dizygotic slash brother slash sister slash uh, parents slash grandparents. I'm wondering why you don't, didn't take that shortcut here that would have seemed to save you an awful lot of steps, save you an awful lot of money, and why you didn't comment on that in terms of risk factor of twin-twin. Even though Parkinsonianism is a very heterogeneous group, you could have done monozygotic twins for uh, at least a few of the groups and commented on it, huh? Yeah, I think actually because it's already been done. Um, and I don't view it as a shortcut, actually. So when you think about uh, the work that we're doing here, this genetic data was already generated as part of risk identification. So it's, it's free data. It's easy, easy to analyze. Plus, it's data in 10,000 individuals. The, the twin studies, even the fairly well-powered ones, the Scan and I agree Scandinavia has, has done a great job of this, even the fairly well-powered ones in Scandinavia, you're really coming down to 40 or 50 twins that are uh, concordant or discordant for the types of diseases that we're interested in. So I haven't viewed it as a shortcut at all. It hasn't been that useful. OK, thank you. Sure. Uh, could you use the same types of analyses to develop uh, disease prevention strategies? Uh, if you could identify the at-risk persons early enough and integrate environmental data. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think environment is tough, right? Because the genome is huge, but the environment is so much bigger and, and multidimensional, right? But um, I think that one of the things that's clear is that as a society, we're starting to collect more data. We're becoming more driven by our own health. So I think that prospectively, um, uh, collecting that kind of data and storing that data in health systems is, is the way to do exactly what you're suggesting. And if we could find an intervention that's not, not pharmacological, great, you know, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Really impressive work. When you mentioned constipation, I thought about gut, and then that reminded me that LARC2 has been associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah. So do you think there might be a connection to the gut and perhaps inflammation in Parkinson disease? Uh, yeah, inflammation, yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's the case, although I think that um, uh, probably the constipation is driven by autonomic dysfunction rather than uh, something directly going on in the gut, but um, you know, I, don't, I don't know that as an answer. But there's a great deal of interest in uh, LERC2 in the context of inflammation rather than its role directly in, in neurons. Let me ask you a, 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 another question. As you're strategizing, either in your own lab, if you've done so well with an integrated program from gene discovery, risk factors, through mechanisms, targets, et cetera, and, and especially when you expand upon that to a strategy nationally, internationally for, for allocating resources, how, how do you judge the point at which there are diminishing returns in a particular area? So genetics, when you've accounted for a given proportion of genetic risk factors, uh, is that, is that a useful figure or not? Because as you point out, if you, if you continue to look, you may find some which have very minor contributors to overall risk, but identify n new pathways of interest. So do you look at the point at which you are saturating pathway discovery. When you find more and more of your discovered risk or protective factors are concentrating on already known pathways, do you then begin to think of a shift away from discovery there towards more proportionate effort in investigating the, the, the molecular uh, aspects that are downstream of the genetic polymorphisms. So this sounds like, from someone who controls my budget, this sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> when do I stop? When do I stop doing genetics? Well, no, I mean, you're I'm just, I'm you, teasing. But I'm, um, I would say, you know, because your lab is doing yeah, yeah, doing yeah, it yeah. all, you, yeah, can't, yeah. you can't lose. Really, really, it's a, it's a question yeah, projecting yeah, yeah. on what you're doing. To, no, I'm teasing. To I'm teasing. Uh, I, um, it's a good question. I think that um, the answer to the question is is a subtle one, and that is that. So much more of the genetics is becoming pretty cheap to do. Um, the genetics data lives on forever, so you know it's there forever. So I think that there's still a lot of a great deal of value in doing this genetics. But uh, but I actually think that we'll get to a point where we've produced enough genetic data, and it, and it's not too too far off, um, where discovery will be looped back in from the functional data. So that's something that we're seeing more and more often that. Um, our next genetic hit is being highlighted not by 
simple association or segregation, but by stuff that, that Mark or Wybin are telling us about interesting interactors that they found. So, so that's where I think the subtlety, subtlety lies. All right, with that, let me again invite people first to, to, uh, to thank Andy and then to move with us to the library for a little food and drink.